A Day and a Life Chapter 15 The Office of Known is so called because it marks the ninth hour of the day. At this hour, Peter and John went up to the temple to pray and healed the man begging at Beautiful Gate. Cornelius the Centurion had his vision and Jesus died. These things happened a long time ago. But the great cry of Jesus, it is finished, is carried in the heart of every brother every day. For that accomplishment directly affects them, being the work of their salvation. Momentous as the death of Jesus surely is, and though monasticism perseveres with the psalmists seven times a day, do I praise thee. There's no doubt about it. The office of known obtrudes annoyingly into the day. So Brother Stephen thinks, anyway. In the summer timetable, because daybreak is so early, he nips up to the farm after lords and breakfast to milk the cows. If he's quick and has help, he can get the cows milked and turn them out to pasture before prime, first mass and chapter. That means legging it up the hill and setting about it with dispatch, but what else can he do? A cow needs milking. Everything else gets left and even then is often late for the office, sometimes even late into Mass. If there's any serious business dragging out the chapter meeting, he has his work cut out because after that it's back up the hill to strain the milk, feed the pigs and look over the sheep. He swills down the house where the cows are milked and the dairy, but in truth it's often a hasty job because through the morning the novices are at their lessons and he has no help. The poultry aren't his job. Brother Giles looks after them. He barrows the milk down the hill to the kitchen, has a quick wash and goes into terse and high mass. Then back up to the farm to attend to whatever work awaits him until the bell rings out for sext and the midday meal. After they've eaten, he can have one or two novices Sometimes a few schoolboys, if their lessons are done for the day. Even Brother Giles and Brother Wallifred, though not today, to help him around the farm. In these last few weeks, he's scavenged all the help on offer to get the fruit in and the grain. Glad of a stretch of fine weather after so many wet summers. But what really tries his patience, whether they're cutting rye, barley, oats, wheat, building the ricks, mending a wall, whatever they're working on, is having to come back down for known, smack dab in the middle of the afternoon. Known takes barely more than a quarter hour and it drives him mad when they must every man of them down tools walk all the way along the farm track and all the way back up again after for a few psalms, a couple of Bible readings, a canticle and intercession for the world's poor and struggling. What makes him feel even worse is his deep, inescapable shame at regarding the divine office as a tedious interruption to necessary farm work. When he needs no one to tell him, what he came here to do is hold all life, including his own, before the loving face of Almighty God and make of his hours a ceaseless stream of thanksgiving, praise and prayer. 
The rest he manages to juggle with good grace. It's known that gets him. Just now he's refusing to look ahead beyond Michaelmas when they change to the winter hours. The days will be shorter. Beasts out to pasture in the summer will be in the byre and needing food fetching for them. And the shrinking days mean shorter intervals between the obligations of the monastic horarium. From Lammas right through to last week, as many brothers as the house could spare have laboured to bring in the grain. It's all safely gathered in. So today, Brother Stephen, with Brother Placidus and Brother Josephus to help him, has been threshing, winnowing and sieving wheat up in the big barn. He's pleased. They've done well. When they hear the bell begin to ring for the office, obediently they set aside the flails, unroll their sleeves and unkilt the skirts of their habits, shaking out as much as they can of the dust and chaff, freeing it from their hair, knocking it out of their sandals. And then they set off at a good pace down the hill to the chapel. Brother Stephen asked his abbot's permission to work through the afternoon during harvest. At the height of it, in mid-August, seeing the weather was holding and the whole community depends on that grain for the winter, Abbot John agreed to it. But now the sheaves are in under cover. He insists Stephen come down every day for known. It's what you're here for, brother, he said. I know how vital your work is on the farm. It was the same for me with the infirmary. There was nothing that could be neglected or put to one side. I was responsible for the well-being of sick men, as you have the care of livestock and the task of feeding us all. It is no small thing. But... Or so I often thought when it exasperated me to stop right in the middle of something to be present with the community at prayer. There's a snare in this. Because the work is essential and won't wait, the temptation is to begin to see the duty of prayer as a lesser thing, as something small and distracting, an addendum to what really matters. I can't tell you how often I had to admit that line of thought to my confessor. It's a dangerous track to follow. That way travel the lost. Whether or not someone is dying or a you is giving birth, the work of prayer is still our central calling and our first duty. So no, I'm very sorry. You do have to come down the hill and join us for known. What you are is a monk, not a farmer. Brother Stephen heard this in silence. Sometimes when a man does not speak, it's a form of resistance, a refusal to engage. Not in this case. And his abbot did not mistake Stephen's silence for obstinacy. He stood mulling over what John had said to him. And eventually he replied, Aye, you're right. Please forgive me, I got carried away. Father Lucanus, your novice master too, wasn't he? Or did you have Father Matthew? Anyway, he used to say to us, Be wary, lads. Watch yourselves. Have a care not to get possessive, not to get wrapped up in the work you do. 
keep one step back. Remember, you have only one job to do and one master to serve. Leave the men of the world to fall in love with their occupations if they find it satisfying. You keep your eyes on Jesus. <laughs> Comes back as if it was only yesterday. That's what he used to say. Drummed it into us at every passing opportunity. And look at me. I still forget. I am so sorry. His abbot's eyes shone with affection and respect. Thank you for understanding, he said. And when there's something you simply cannot leave, well, I will understand too. And this afternoon, just as Brother Basil stops ringing the bell, Brother Stephen, Brother Placidus and Brother Josephus fragrant with the dusty goodness of golden grain, are in their places in the nick of time before the abbot gives the knock and the community rises to pray. <coughs> this is one of those chapters that divides in two. And this is the second half. Not everyone experience is known as a maddening interruption of vital work. To some men, sometimes, this brief space of prayer and chanting feels as though you just threw them a lifeline, as it does to Brother Damien today. This all begins earlier in the day when he says he can manage without Brother Josephus in the Abbey School since Brother Stephen is looking desperate about extra hands still needed up on the farm. Normally, Brother Tom will help out until the grain is all threshed and stored, but the abbot has sent him off on some errand that will fill up the entire day. Colin is handy and practical, but Father Theodore says they can't have him today because Father Gilbert needs him to practice his singing and his refectory readings. When Brother Josephus says he'll go up to the farm then, reluctantly, neither he nor Brother Damien realise that Father Gilbert wants two of the novices as well as Colin and one of those is Brother Cassian, which leaves Brother Damien on his own in the school. The boys are in boisterous spirits, having spent most of the last three weeks picking fruit and generally larking about on the farm. Brother Damien is put to it to get them even sitting still and paying attention. One particularly overexcitable juvenile, given to pinching his neighbour and causing much hilarity among his classmates by finding it necessary to fall off the bench or drop his stylus or sneeze explosively, or shriek when the boy next to him pinches him back, eventually exhausts Brother Damien's patience. Attempting nothing more taxing than teaching them, line by line, the Apostles' Creed, he finds the task made untenable by this delinquent's relentless and asinine interruptions. And in the end, he loses his temper. Ah, damn it, child, he blazes at him. Whatever devil of hell took up lodging in your brainless skull? Are you out of your right mind? Or didn't anyone ever teach you how to behave? Were you dragged up in a barn, you confounded little wretch? Can you not sit still for two minutes together? One more word from you. I mean it. One more word. And by the mass you better believe it. And I'll have that birch down and really give you something to squawk about. 
Now, this threat quickly proves unfortunate. Consumed with gruesome childish eagerness to see one of their company tortured, from this point on, the rest of the class spare no effort to goad the lad in every imaginable manner. Every time Brother Damien turns his back, or even takes his eyes off the boy, someone tweaks the lad's clothes, or tugs his hair, or pulls a mocking face at him. Not a placid individual at the best of times, he's beside himself under this concentrated torment. All of it covert, sly, and most artfully concealed from their infuriated schoolmaster. Twizzling and thwacking, exclaiming continently for no good reason that the master can see, the young scamp generates such mayhem that in the end Damien is ready to make good on his word. His face grim, he dismisses the school early. He does what he can to redeem things from an appearance of disintegrating out of control by telling them Brother Stephen has so much work in hand he has no time to forage for morsels to feed the pigs. This is entirely true of course, always, though it omits the detail that seeing pigs are ideally adapted to foraging for themselves with no help from anyone searching out delicacies to tempt them is not how Brother Stephen would have spent any afternoon. But Brother Damien tells them to find a pail up on the farm for whatever they collect, be it beech mast, acorns, toadstools, slugs or snails, and don't bring them back here, he thinks to add. I don't want them. The pigs will be in the orchard like as not. You can take them up there. Once you've fed them, you can go home. Collaring his young ruffian firmly when the wretch hastens to escape through the door with the others, who look back over their shoulders, grinning and pointing as they set off, Damien keeps a relentless hold on him until they've gone. He pushes the door shut after them with his foot and drags the now frightened child across the room. He feels the boy's panic and the turbulence of his fear, but he doesn't care because he's angry. Grim with rage, he tightens his grip on the resisting, protesting boy and grabs the birch down from its nail on the wall. There's no likelihood of the child keeping still, that's not his temperament, nor is there anything calm and measured about this. It's a fight to hold him. He's too big to go over Brother Damien's knee, but the monk, capable and strong, roars at him to shut up, slams him face down onto the master's table and pins him there with one hand firmly planted on his back. Irate, he slaps the birch down alongside on the table to get back a free hand for roughly yanking down the boy's breeches, then grabs the rod and gives it all he's got six vicious stripes before he lets him go. Furious as he is, the sight of the lad's howling red face running with tears as the boy struggles his clothes back in place gives him immense satisfaction. The birch hurts, he knows it does. He left red swelling wheels where he sliced him. Now. Get out and don't come back here until you can behave, he yells at him. Still bellowing, the child turns and runs, knocking a bench over as he stumbles into it, yanking the door open so it crashes back against the wall as he goes. Alone in the classroom, still angry, Damien hangs the birch back on the, up on the wall, his heart hammering, he sets about tidying the room, restoring order. He picks up the kicked over bench, straightens all the benches back as they should be, collects the boxwood wax tablets that have dropped to the floor in the eager exodus 
kneeling down to retrieve styluses scattered here and there. As his rage subsides, he feels shaky and upset, but he doesn't want to acknowledge it. The child behaved abominably. He deserved a thrashing. Eventually, the room stands in impeccable condition. There's nothing left to do. And Damien feels rotten. He pulls the door shut behind him as he leaves the building and walks, his shoulders hunched, looking at nothing but the dust of the ground, to the church. He takes refuge in his stall and within the shortest time, Brother Basil begins to ring the bell for noon. Force of habit has Brother Damien sitting, standing, uttering responses, saying his Amen. But his mind is in turmoil. He tries to find a way into the peace and cannot. He can hear the child bawling, see the tears, see the rising red stripes on his flesh. Even so, the serenity of the Gregorian chant gives him something to hang on to, a means of re-establishing some kind of core. At the end of the office, as the brothers go about whatever the rest of the day contains for them, Damien reverences the presence of Christ in the sanctuary and turns to go, but listlessly now. Brother Cassian appears at his side. They shouldn't talk in church, but are you all right? School went smoothly. Damien just looks at him. No, I think I better talk to Father John. He turns back and there is his abbot, eyebrows raised in inquiry. Cassian sees where he's not wanted and discreetly withdraws. Brother Damien walks back with his superior to the abbot's house and John listens seriously and attentively as the young monk tells him what happened. When you say you hit him hard, he asks, what do you mean? Did you break his skin? How many times did you hit him? I gave him six strokes with the birch, which is more than he deserved, and I didn't hold back. Not enough to cut him, but I was just out of my depth. Damien answers, and I'm sorry, Father. I'm so sorry. I'm so ashamed of myself. I should have been able to do better than that. It was violent, horrible. Such a skinny little runt. Nothing much of him, and me a grown man. I should be taking responsibility for the situation, not thrashing him with sticks. Boys are beaten every day, of course, and expect no sympathy from their parents and teachers. It's just the way of the world. But he wonders, does it mess things up even more if I apologise to him? He was badly out of order. But if I'm honest, so was I. It got past a reprimand or a just punishment. I scared him and I really hurt him. Can you? I was too rough with him, Father. I frightened him. I... Well, can you? Should you? Say sorry to a child. The abbot considers this in silence. He thinks of his bishop, who at the last visitation chided him for letting the birch gather dust told him it must be laid on harder and more frequently. He thinks about that. 
and about the accustomed ways of keeping discipline in school. I don't see why not, he says. It's hard to move on from something you regret if you don't put it right first. It lodges inside you. And I'd rather the lads in our school learned from us that power is meant for gentleness. Think carefully though. You can't back down from your authority or your requirements of him or you'll mire yourself in deeper. Maybe see how he is when he next shows up for school. Assess the changes in him. Words aren't always the best way of healing a relationship and it pays to be cautious. Use restraint. Think it through and learn from what happened. I'm sorry you were left on your own and everything got so badly out of hand. We let you down. Thank you for telling me. I doubt very much if the lad will say anything to his parents, and if he doesn't, I don't think you need to either. Sounds as though you gave him chastisement enough without bringing down his father's wrath on his head as well. I think in all honesty, I'd let it be if I were you. But take it into your prayers, and so will I. Watch to see how things unfold. Realising he should have locked up the schoolroom, Brother Josephus usually does it, Damien goes back to get the key from its hook behind the door. Rounding the corner of the building, to his astonishment, he finds the same child dawdling about outside, mooching along, kicking at stones in the dust, evidently waiting for him. He looks down at the grubby face, the only clean bits washed by the boy's own tears, his eyes still swollen from weeping. I'm sorry, Brother Damien, says the miscreant. To Damien's surprise, his anxiety plain to see as he plucks up courage, he begs, please don't tell me, Dad, or I'll catch it from him. In the worried upraised face, the monk sees the fears and affliction of childhood. Not if you'd rather I didn't, he says, but look, it's your secret, not mine. And I'm glad you came back. I wanted to talk to you because I think I frightened you. And I laid about you cruelly with that rod. I cannot have you go on as you did today. But I'm sorry too. I'm sorry I lost my temper. Shall we start again? Don't be scared to come back to school tomorrow. You won't still be in trouble. Try it if you can. To be a bit calmer than you were today. Something is restored in both of them as they part company. Brother Damien walking back to the claustral buildings of the monastery reflects that though he came out of the world to this place to draw closer to God, the main thing he's found himself encountering is raw, uncompromised humanity, not least his own. And he thinks maybe those two things are not as distinct as he always assumed. Chapter 16, next time.
you been doing today then? Has it been a good day so far? How are things going for you in this world turned upside down? I don't mean in these videos to impose on you my spirituality and my way of doing things. <clears throat> but somebody did say she liked it when we have a prayer. So I'll carry on doing that. And if you don't want to, if you just want the story, you can always stop the video. But let's pray together if you want to. Father God, we think about the circumstances of our own lives. This is the place where we meet you. This is the ground on which we work out our salvation. In our homes, in our day-to-day -day lives, this is the material and the substance of our prayer, our faithfulness. This is the mirror that reflects back to us what we really believe, who we will follow, what we will choose. And so we ask you, God our Father, guide us by your Holy Spirit, lead us, keep us close to Jesus. Help us to make this our homes, our lives, the path of faith, the journey of salvation. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace to you. May you have patience to live with the questions still unresolved in your heart. Remember when you are afraid, that little prayer that came from the Psalms that Brennan Manning flags up, the prayer of King David, when I am most afraid, I put my trust in you. Remember that when the world seems difficult, it's just a little prayer that makes all the difference. As well as the other one, Brennan Manning taught, Abba, I belong to you. Those are good kitchen prayers. Blessings on your day.